Hello and welcome to Skeleton Songs. Do we need an age warning on this one? Um, no, because the title will say something wry and knowing, and those who know will know, and those who don't will not tell their parents. This episode mm. is about sex. And games. And literature. <laughs> and the liberty novels of 18th century France. <laughs> Which is not at all us trying to justify a core subject matter with some literary underpinnings. It's um, not going to be cause, actually. I think there's nah. actually a lot of interesting things to say about it. And I think one of the reasons that you don't have a frank discussion of sex and games is because sex makes a lot of people feel really weird. And I just think a lot of people need to chill out about that. I mean, sex is weird. It's sort of, It you is know, squicky. Yeah, flappy and slappy. Okay, this is already too much. <laughs> That's horrible. You know that science fiction story, they're made out of meat? Are you going to ruin more sex for more people? That's literally my job. It absolutely is not, and might I remind you, you're my fiancé, so if you could just keep a lid on that part of your personality. Talleyrand, the uh, ecclesiast, scholar, raconteur, um, ambassador, and Napoleon's primary diplomat. Right. Uh, he is... Sounds like a card. He, he, he was a card. Um, I... Uh, it's funny, I've been reading um, Alistair Campbell's thing on depression recently and, and uh, Campbell and Talleyrand both sound not entirely dissimilar people. Uh, I think they'd probably both be flattered by the comparison. Uh, a lot of quotes are ascribed, uh, ascribed to Talleyrand. Um, um, he didn't say most of them. Uh, one of the ones <laughs> that he almost certainly didn't say is he described um, uh, coffee, his perfect coffee, is black as the devil, hot as hell, pure as a virgin... <laughs> and sweet as love uh, I take my coffee without without sugar but I'm having it black this morning because I'm old and weak and I needed some juicing up <laughs> and that relates to sex well it's 18th century so do you, should we talk, start by talking <laughs> about the 18th century or should we talk about, talk, by talking about games because this is this, I mean you start the, with the 18th century thing now so I think you should follow through well because the inspiration behind this podcast ultimately is um, your article isn't it on yeah boobs. so um there is an article on the on the weather factory website called the law of boob an inspired title inspired mm-hmm. obviously by the subject matter where i talk about um sex games because i hear a lot of things said negatively about a lot of um games on steam particularly which are pretty clearly just an excuse to look at anime boobs really and you often see an example of this, or several examples of this, in the in the new and trending section on the Steam um, homepage. And this is something as an indie developer that you would literally kill for. If you could get your game on the front page of Steam, some people will die, and that's a justifiable uh, cost, frankly. So, understandably, a lot of people think, why is it that all these sort of low rent sex games are on the front page of Steam and and, and isn't that annoying and, and frustrating? And I understand that um, attitude because. I would much rather Cultist Simulator was there than a game about boobs. But I I disagree. Um, I did a piece for Wireframe, which is a British uh, game dev magazine where I have a monthly column, um, talking about how sex games are actually a brilliant example of product market fit, which is incredibly boring. Um, But hang on, I have stats to make it more fun. Oh, cool. So um, we can do a fun game, Alexis. Do you want to guess, as of today, the rough Steam user score of the following games? Fallout 4. 83%. Ah, oh, 79. Not bad, though. Far Cry 5. Ooh, uh, 72%. Actually, a little better, 78. Mm. Um, PUBG. Player Unknown's Battleground. 81%. That's a 53. Really? It's a 53. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll release you from your pain for the rest of it. Horizon Zero Dawn. Because it's freaking multiplayer. Um, one one of the best RPGs in, in recent memory. That's 80%, which has now been um, officially proven to be 2% less good than Cultist Simulator. And I'm delighted to say that Cultist Simulator is exactly the same goodness as GTA V. Um, both sitting pretty on 82%. So this gives you a rough idea of the kind of you know user scores on Steam... Um, for, for some really popular games and then ours. <laughs> now let's compare that to some sex games, shall we? Deep Space Waifu Nekumimi, 97%. There's not a game actually called Deep Space Waifu Nekumimi. There is, and you shoot Neko clothes off people. Cat, right? There's a lot of cat sex games. Love What's the Cute, meme bit? 94. I don't know, mean boob or something. The Ditsy love Demons Cute. Are In Love With Me, another 97%. <laughs> and I'm not making this up, there's one new trending right now, literally uh-huh. called Being a Dick. But dick is spelt with a Greek delta 
and an IK, I assume to get around Steam's you're not allowed to swear in the title of your game. That's also a 97%, which means that Deep Space Waifu Nekomimi, Love Cubed, The Ditsy Demons Are In Love With Me, and Being A Dick, oh, Love Cubed is low, but the, the three are all exactly the same percentage of popular as The Witcher 3, which is widely considered the best RPG that has ever been made. So I think, you know, this, this is, I find it really funny. Um, but I also think it's actually a really useful lesson that that it is not that sex games are intrinsically awful, although I probably would say that they tend to follow lower product values and they tend to be the same type of game, which is kind of anime, visual novelty, match three, you know, not, not super absorbing gameplay, um, but they clearly resonate with the audience that they're trying to resonate with. And that mm. is the dream as an indie developer. You don't, I'm not trying to please everybody. If you do pl- try and please everybody, your review score tends to go down because you can't be everything to everyone. And if a million people play your game, there's going to be more people who dislike your game than mm. if, you, if, you, if you sell it to 10 people where 10 people might like it and nobody might dislike it. Um, so I think there's a lot of stuff that you can learn as a developer from the sex genre on PC. I think, I think you're right. Um, but also it's funny. Uh, amazingly, I think you're right. Uh, the, it reminds me, there's, there's another game which isn't a sex game, to be clear, um, which I was recommended many times and kept bouncing off and have two date bounced off it's it's called something like Valhalla but some of the letters are replaced with numbers and it's a cyberpunk bartending game which, which sounds fun but it's How very much it? in the visual novel tradition so there's lots and lots and lots of dialogue you click through and not much in the way of gameplay there's more gameplay than most because there's the, the, the bartending bit and I like my mixology and I just could not get on with it. But it's, it's, I forget the precise review score, but it's overwhelmingly positive and enormously successful. Yeah. And I talked to a couple of folk about why, because I didn't, I don't want to diss it. Uh, it's very much sort of not for me, rather than I thought it was actually bad. Yes. I didn't get it. And I think that's the answer. It's not for me. It's, it's for the people who like that. There's a really bitchy quote from The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, um, where. One of the girls who Miss Jean Brody's protégés asks her, uh, what do you think about the, the girl guides? Uh, and she says, for those who like that sort of thing, that is the sort of thing they like. And uh, that's the, it, the, the mural of Spark said that left the girls in no doubt about Miss Jean Brody's <laughs> opinion. And, and that's sort of what I, you know, that, that's also about visual novels and um, anime boot games. And all that For those who like that sort of thing. But I'm not being bitchy. It's just obviously people like a certain sort no, of approach. No, I think that's a really important thing to say because I, I've been on record several times as a feminist and I am now going on record and, uh, as a woman and saying I'm a woman. Mm. Um, so there are, of course... Thank you very much. Um, it's been a long time coming. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there are a lot of depictions. I would say almost every depiction I've ever seen of a woman in a sex game is... Um, insulting to me personally mm. because women are you know presented as, as objects for primarily heterosexual men to look at with implausible body types um and no personality other than either dominatrix or subservient pseudo kid which is all very odd um but one this is in the context usually of an anime trope where, where the character is a bit different to kind of western uh Feminism, so so that needs to be taken into account. And two, I think it's absolutely fine if a heterosexual man wants to look at a woman like in in, in a sexy way that isn't about how much she's read or how many podcasts she does or or whether mm. or not you know it's not about me. It's about the person playing that game. And I think it is absolutely fine and beyond fine and 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 great that we have all these different games that serve different people, even if parts of that game are not something that I want. So I think saying it's not for me, but but I'm still glad that people enjoy it is exactly mm. the the attitude that I take with sex stuff because, you know, I, it's not where I go to for my own gratification. But if people enjoy it, then then great. You know, if it actually hurts real people in real life, then that would be a line. Um, and I can see an argument for saying that it perpetuates harmful stereotypes about women. Mm. Um, but I also think people should be given a, a little bit more benefit of the doubt or respect or whatever it is. You know, if somebody's entire opinion on women is informed by anime match three games on Steam, I think there's probably more going on wrong in that person's life than them having played a lot of mm. anime games on Steam. Um, and equally, I think if you play an anime game on Steam where there's lots of 
ladies with boobs and, and not much else I don't think that will automatically kind of drain your brain of any feminist ideals that you hold inside you or any realistic conceptions of women that you've met in your life so so I think you know that argument is is not convincing that that these things are sort of bad for society I so you'll be amazed to hear I agree with you because as you know I'm I'm, I'm um it's going to get a really boring podcast, isn't it? By, by episode well, I was gonna... 10, we'll be like, yeah, good point. Well, so, so the thing is, I feel I feel very strongly about free speech and liberal values. And um, I think as soon as one starts telling people what they should and should not read, um, one is probably going to do some damage. And as soon as one starts telling people what they can um, do in the bedroom, uh, uh, either with other people or alone, um, one does a lot more damage. I mean, th- 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 this way, bad things lie. I think it's also worth mentioning that there are some specific issues with porn, erotica, sex, sex games, all the rest of it, uh, which are much more immediate than um, promoting disrespectful representations of women. So, for example, um, (laughs) without getting too personal, the first few times I saw a naked woman... (laughs) Um, I was quite surprised. I wasn't surprised because I, you know, I'm not stupid. But they didn't look like naked women I'd seen in films and magazines. Oh man! And well, because nobody does. You know, I Cindy Crawford know. famously I'm still said, "Coming to terms with this." Cindy Crawford said, "Women ask me how they can get my breasts, and I say, sweetheart, I don't even have my breasts. <laughs> you know, you think they look like in real life, and, and that's the thing that you you end up with unrealistic expectations." primarily held by men about primarily women but not exclusively you know well, yet to meet a man have... who's an inguinal crease in real life and you know it's that that tendon thing that goes down the side of like oh, your, yeah. yeah apparently yeah. you have to have that to get get cast sort of as a body double in a male sex scene anyway but you know the expectations and and we're given to understand that that um women's body dysmorphia has not improved. The struggle is real. Years. And the, I grew up in an age before fucking Instagram. Yeah. You know, my kid, who's now 11 and, and, and negotiating the shoals of puberty, uh, is, uh, you know, at any point, if she felt like making her life miserable, could look at 12 dozen yeah. incredibly perfect looking female bodies. Yeah. And if she were a boy, at any moment, she'd be looking at 12 dozen incredibly perfect female bodies and, I think it's interesting and if I'd been an 11 year old boy and Instagram had been around I'd have spent a lot of time on Instagram I suspect and I think there is um, data that shows particularly there is a, a significant increase in boys negative self image because of this I think women yeah. for, for, for lots of complicated reasons throughout centuries have, have basically been taught to, to find ourselves unsatisfactory and to try and change ourselves to please primarily men um, whether that's visually or, or, or personality wise whatever it is and I think men have in some ways had an easier ride in that regard even though they have their own struggles and have been taught you know, that you shouldn't have feelings and that you should go to war and die um, but, but we are now seeing that teenage boys are apparently much more conscious of the way they look and much more dissatisfied with it because mm. of exactly this sort of stuff it's not, it's not that we're teaching boys to be, to be vain or concerned about pleasing women aesthetically like women are taught to please men but it is that as you say there is now so much uh, imagery of perfect and unrealistic body expectations that that boys on social media can't really avoid it even looking at like fashion and makeup like like a lot of girls are um, they still see all these images that they wouldn't have seen 100 years ago mm. and they start thinking that's not really what I look like should I be worried about that and of course they are because anxiety always looks for things to latch onto so we've got off the topic here about and like I don't know. I sound like a really old person saying social media should be banned. So I think we should. Well, this is this back is, this away. is what, the, the, <laughs> one of the biggest reasons I'm again banning things or or censoring things is that it doesn't fucking work. What happens if you ban something or send something? It goes on the ground. Mm. Everybody really really wants to do it. So if you tell people you can't look at boobs, uh, then all the fifteen year olds grow up um, making a point about looking at boobs and, and it, if you are the Chinese Communist Party and you cannot manage to stop people posting um, Winnie the Pooh pictures yeah. then what hope do we have? Well good luck being a, a sort of gently left of centre or gently right of centre because it comes from both sides mm. these days uh, a social activist group trying to get Steam to take some of the anime boobs off <laughs> You know, it, it's it's even before the internet it was difficult. Do you know? Uh, I mean, you do because this particular question I asked you earlier. But for rhetorical <laughs> uh, features, what what the most successful genre by a country mile 
of publishing in 18th century France was? I don't, Alexis. Could you tell me? It was porn. Ah! It was, you know, you, you get the printing press, you realise you can uh, produce reasonably, uh, with reasonable fidelity, line art. Mm. And what you have is lots of people in, in a variety of, of, of positions on each other with their clothes in some disarray. And of course, it wasn't just the pictures. Um, although one of the books I'm about to mention, I was looking at um, covers of them and, and there was one um, which had the title of the book and it says underneath the very big letters, Avec Figure, oh, which I believe gosh. means with illustrations. Gross. Uh, but but it's, it's also, you know, the text, because uh, I understand that if you write things down in a convincing way, it can almost be <laughs> like you experience those things. <laughs> But it, it, it was porn, erotic literature in, in 18th century France. And I don't know about um, other countries at the time. You know, I know France has this sort of uh, libertine tradition, uh, but I'm sure they were equally successful I'm uh, confident traditions that's in other parts true, of because Europe. That's, yeah. that, that's the big thing. I think, I think you know, sex makes people uncomfortable when they talk about it, and, and nobody should have to talk about it if they don't want to. But, but I, I would encourage people to be more frank and normal about it because sex is happening all the time across the world, mm. and it's something that lots of people really enjoy. And um, for the most part, it's something that's a really positive experience for everyone involved. Um, and you know, the reason that we see... Uh, a lot of, you know, the fact that sex sells is such a famous phrase is because um, f for the majority of history, it has been majoritively about humans mm. and the majority of humans quite like sex. Mm. So, so of course, there's going to be a host of industries that are very successful mm. that last forever. I mean, everyone says, you know, the oldest profession in the world is prostitution because mm. because regardless of whether you live in a cave or you live in a glass skyscraper shaped like a swan in Dubai <laughs> like like everybody in that building not everybody yeah. the majority of people in that building will be quite interested in sex with somebody at some point in their lives I think one of the wiser things I heard uh, two of the wiser things I've heard said about sex um, are by Peter Bradshaw the Guardian film critic right uh, one he was talking about the uh, the, the sinister acronym um I think it's OLDC or DCOL. Do you know this one? I don't. Doesn't count on location or on location doesn't count. Oh, God, yeah. Because if you're an A-lister and you go off and you make a film with another A-lister and you're both really hot, you might end up having a, you know, a sneaky grapple in the trailer. Uh, and, and maybe you won't mention it to your significant other uh, when you get home. Uh, and oh, that's so sad. And he, he said, this is Wisdom One, is, is famous hot people are like the rest of us. They like the idea of having sex with famous hot people. Yeah. But obviously, you know, if you're Brad Pitt, then you're more likely to end up in bed. With Angelina Jolie. Exactly. For example. And I think it was actually Mr. and Mrs. Smith that he was talking about, uh, which, which starred the pair of them. That's one thing. And the other thing, he was talking about the notorious Caligula which was a... I'm not sure a, I'd take much sex advice from Caligula, I'll be honest. Well, it was, it was a... a, a I think sort of probably mid-core by today's standards, um, filled with lots of gilded dildos, uh, <laughs> about the orgies that Caligula, uh, if you're an Italian film director, um, you, you know, you'd expect Caligula to have thrown. Uh, and it, it, it was re-released in an age that was less impressed by uh, debauchery on screen, because obviously, you know, the 60s and 70s, this thing was much more like to scandalise the establishment and now the establishment has probably grown up watching like Emmanuel uh, which you know again hilariously softcore by the ideal standards but uh, 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 and it was described sneerily as boring by a number of sort of literati and twitterati types and Bradshaw said porn is rarely exactly boring uh, you know it may be off-putting it may mm. be distasteful uh, it may be something you, you, you'd not want to watch, but watching attractive people having sex with each other mm. is something that's quite hard for humans to find boring. Mm. You know, if you put a picture, a video on the corner of the room, this is now me, not Bradshaw, uh, of, of two bumblebees banging, then... Alexis. You, you probably, well, no, you know, you'd see two sort of furry things uh, and you probably wouldn't, wouldn't be distracted by it. If you put a picture on in the corner of the room a video in the corner of the room of two people having sex, mm. then, you know, those of us who do not work in the adult You'd film industry... You'd notice it, wouldn't you? Yeah, we'd probably have a hard time having a chat about uh, uh, tennis. And I think that's that goes a long way in explaining why there are a lot of sex games 
um, and they don't seem to be super high quality or have much gameplay in them mm. because, as you say, sex is or well, porn is never boring. So if you set out deliberately to make a game about sex, and I'm not talking about sex in games. Mm. So, for example, you know, everyone knows that in Bioware games you get to romance people, and that often leads to a sort of classy blackout and some sort of knowing remark the morning after. Mm. Or, or The Witcher, I understand, there's quite a lot of like ability to have sex with people in a relatively classy way. Um, but but in your actual hentai game, where mm. it's about seeing as much of a woman without any clothes on as possible I don't think you necessarily need that much gameplay because people are not coming for the gameplay people are coming for the sex mm. um, and, and these developers know that you know sex is never boring so they just need to put a bunch of naked people in it and the people who come for naked people will be happy but I think that leads me on to an interesting example of this um, in games I don't know if everybody listening has heard of Subverse I believe it's mm. called now if you google um, Kickstarter sex game. I'm delighted to tell you that Subverse is the top hit. And Subverse, I think, is really interesting. I think it, I think it is the single best-funded video game ever on Kickstarter. I think it mm. got something like £3 million pounds donate, or pledged or something. Certainly much more than it had asked for. And what it is, is a, a sort of porn game that is basically glued on to... Uh, oh, what's that space game you like playing? Uh, Mass Effect. No, the other one. Uh, elite. Yes, right. it's a sex game glued onto Elite. Okay, but it, but but just just to be nerdy and building consensusy about it. For oh a yeah, uh, it's not really. It's it's uh, so for the for the uh, uh, full disclosure here. I I purchased Dubverse because I was curious. Because we uh, talked and about I'll describe it, and it my experiences really shortly. Uh, but I refunded it after like fifty minutes yeah. because I thought this it's, it's, it's not for me. So, um, Subverse is a uh, quite a, quite a alarmingly obvious Mass Effect pastiche in some parts. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that, that they seem to have got away with that being sued by EA and uh, welded to a, a, a sort of simple, quite highly polished bullet hell um, game where you're, you're flying around uh, zapping things. And then in between times, there's some sort of cut scenes and dialogue scenes and things where you you have a sort of um what should we call it what, what, are, the, what are those what are those uh tiny horrible things you you like that kill each other and then fall asleep and you find them in the forest and there's you're talking about cats no uh there's there's a small child and she imprisons them um what? and they come out and they try to kill each other and sometimes they're on fire uh at lego they're all made of fucking lego uh Oh, you know, there's loads of them, and they've all got different names. It's the same game repackaged, and Pokemon. Them, that's the one. Yeah, so it's sort of Pokemon, but with sexy alien ladies. Okay, well, the journey you took me on to describe Pokemon <laughs> has, has wiped everything else from my mind. But I, I think what's interesting about Subverse is uh, the fact that for the first time that I've seen, it actually seems a really high quality game. And when you played it, and you were kind of like a bit embarrassed about it and made sure like I was around when you were playing it, so it didn't look like you were being a creepy guy in a dark room on your own. Um, you seemed to really enjoy the space mechanics, mm. like kind of Mass Effect side. Well, that's the thing. It was, it was, and it, then it was kind of ruined by some really explicit sex stuff. And I, I'm super like you can tell from this podcast, right, that I'm basically sex positive and think everyone should be able to do what they like, provided no one gets hurt and everyone's consenting and it's all great. Um, but I went to look at the Subverse page when it came on Steam out of interest, and and I was actually quite shocked by some of the the screenshots mm. because I thought it was going to be what I'd seen in the kind of anime visual novel sex stuff, which is based basically sort of a lot of girls without their tops on um, looking a bit flustered and, and happy and it's it's really not <laughs> there's mm. quite a lot of kind of well, there's like, arrangement there's, yeah <laughs> I don't know how yeah. to describe and it it's, it's, I mean again let, 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 let me come it's out quite here. hardcore I'm quite vanilla basically I grew up in the 70s and 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 my tastes are very sort of middle of the road and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm fairly easily shocked by anything too hardcore so actually sort of doing a fellatio mini game is a bit a bit much of me yeah so that's that's where I, I bowed out and steve very kindly gave me my 30 quid back uh thanks steve uh and but you know i'm, I'm glad some of us made their goal not to speak a lot of people extremely happy yeah yeah and, and i'm i think i'm glad that it exists like it's absolutely not for me but but basically good on them I think, fit. yeah i think 
product market fit. Exactly. People knew what they were getting and they got into it. And it's it's the thing that really struck me is that it's so polished mm. that when I fired it up and the menu and the graphics That's and the worst thing. Of it, it just, wasn't just no. here's a lady with a top off. And I, and this leads me to another uh I think more complicated example because it involves real people. Mm. So there has been a topical uh, discussion recently, which some listeners may have um, seen, of a very popular Twitch streamer called Amuranth. Um, and she, as far as I can tell, is basically a very attractive lady who streams games in a bikini. Mm-hmm. Now, Twitch has, uh, as you might imagine, a long, complicated history with how much nudity and how much kind of sexual frisson you're allowed to put into a. Um, into a video or a stream because they they very much don't want to be a porn channel but they mm-hmm. also understand that sex sells mm-hmm. and you'd you know there are lots of people who'd like to watch a pretty lady without much clothing on play a game um, so so Amoranth is a pretty lady who doesn't have that many clothes on who plays games and she has been very careful to not um, break any of Twitch's rules which they've recently updated and there used to be a thing where you could stream in in a bikini or swimwear which was the closest you could get to, to actually having a sexy stream and they changed that recently to say you can only do that if you're actually um, in a swimming pool or something so there's now uh, a generation of what are called hot tub streamers who are people who actually put hot tubs in their rooms so they can sit in a bikini, in front of a computer screen, whilst not breaking. Twitch's you know, there are rules. times when I'm depressed, and times when I'm really <laughs> cheered by how inventive you've ever seen. This is the thing. I know it's sort of wonderful, isn't it? Anyway, so she's she's doing very well, and she's very successful, and you know, good, good on her. I think, um, especially because she's being very careful to do everything that Twitch say mm-hmm. that she has to do, and and, and following the rules. Um, but she has been in the news very cross because all of a sudden, with apparently no uh, notification from Twitch, she has had all of her ad revenue taken away from her. All of the ads have stopped running on her streams which she says used to make her about 30 grand a month so Mm. that's really significant Mm. income obviously and she has not violated any of the policies that twitch have um for for sexual content or nudity um and she hasn't done anything different suddenly that might have you know oh that's the thing that i changed that twitch didn't like and, and that's why they've taken my ad revenue away um so on the one hand twitch are a private company and they um she's a twitch partner and there's kind of a kind of a nebulous thing about twitch partners but basically twitch can remove anybody from the partnership scheme at any point if they want mm. to so they don't need they're not in breach of any kind of legal agreement with her um but equally i can see from her point of view that she's a bit cross about it because she has she's, she's literally one of the most popular streamers on twitch as far as i can mm. make out um and suddenly she's been rather hard done by and her business model has been absolutely crippled and i think that's a a a kind of evolution of the stuff we've been talking about because i said earlier that that basically if people want to look at sort of denigrating images of women online for their own you know enjoyment then then basically that's fine as long as people don't get hurt but i think when you start talking about real people that becomes slightly more complicated Mm. so i think looking at a, a real woman who you know is uh, presenting herself in a certain way to please a certain type again to be clear i think it's absolutely fine in her choice and it's all great but i think it, it gets a bit more complicated because it does start affecting real people and you know your daughter that you mentioned earlier she might end up looking at a stream of that lady sometime and thinking that's something that she might want to do and that might be a very positive mm. thing that she might experience later on or it might be a very negative thing and i think i think it's mm. just a, it's, it's a bit more powerful to see an actual human dressing and acting and doing certain things than it is to see a game about it i mm. think that's still one step removed even if it's a very well generated 3d kickstarted game um, that's very believable Um, but that's another kind of example of sex being just this uncomfortable topic that that clearly is hugely pervasive in games whether it's you know you get to romance someone in a visual novel and it's all quite sweet and vanilla or whether it's pretty hardcore simulation in a game that is specifically about sex or whether it's an attractive girl streaming without that many clothes on Um, and we just seem not really happy to talk about it (sighs) I understand why because obviously sex is deeply complicated this amaranth lady uh, Amuran. Amuran. I, I mean, obviously, I have no idea how to pronounce it. Uh, so, so it, was it? Was it? I'm not clear. Did Twitch pull the advertising, or did the advertisers ask Twitch to pull? Twitch pulled it because, as I understand, and people who are listening might know this more than me, um, you only get ad revenue, you only get actual paying ads served on your streams if you mm. are a Twitch partner. And she is a Twitch partner, and they select you based on how popular you are. I think, or mm. you can apply, and they say yes, you meet these criteria. You're now a Twitch partner, um, which obviously gets you more kind of. Uh, promotion and all this kind of stuff um so so i think you would submit an ad Mm. and go for a certain type of streamer so you might say you know my target demographic as monster the the energy drink is 18 year old boys and therefore they are more likely to be put in front of a stream whose demographic is mostly watched by 18 year old boys and that might be that that then goes 
very well with attractive women in mm. bikinis. Um, but but the advertisers have not seen anything that they have said, we're not happy with this content, we're pulling our ads, is that Twitch have decided to demonetize her channel. Mm. So she still can get paid in tips and her, her streamers can still give her money. That's fine. They haven't like actually banned her from the channel, but they have taken away her basic revenue because of something, something sex. The pricking of my thumbs says that there will be more information about this. It has just happened. will clarify the motivation. And not necessarily sort of... Uh, 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 that, that Twitch will be right or Twitch will be wrong, but there, I, I imagine there's there's some movement around the back that that's caused this to happen. I, it also occurs, this is now a little bit more off topic, but but it's relevant. Um, only fans, I keep seeing in the, only fans, only fans. So only fans, if, if you, you you don't ever look at any news, is a subscription service where people can post, people, largely women, can post uh, pictures of themselves in states of undress or videos, and you can subscribe and you yeah. see those pictures, which, which so it's, it's exactly the same sort of unbundling. It's Substack for news, uh, Unbundling? Well, um, <laughs> that's like the unfortunate term. But this is the thing, it used to be that if you wanted to look at a lady with no clothes on, you had to buy my magazine yeah. that had been published in the High Photographers, and now that anyone can have a camera on their phone and yeah. anybody can have access to the internet if somebody monetizes it all they need is a way to do it yeah uh but then i get a bit more props for substack for nudes because i think that's, that's sorry that's that was uh, very good uh so I, i've no idea um uh, amaranth sort of brand or preferences are like so i've no idea if it's kind of person who would for example go to only fans um if the twitch uh well, I think it's difficult for people like her because she is both a gaming streamer exactly. that's, and yeah. she's pretty and... and but the, but, but know, that's what I mean. I mean, I know, I know there are streamers whose who's shtick is that they basically don't have many clothes on while they have you playing a game. And there's also streamers who take games very seriously um, and uh, and it's, you know, the, the bigger part of their identity and it just so happens they also wear revealing clothing. Mm. And I don't have any idea where, where she's on the continuum um, but if she was at one end of the continuum, you know, she she could migrate, and if she wasn't, then she couldn't. Mm. But it, it, I, I think this is a good example of if you're trying to ban something, it ends up going somewhere else. Well, or if you try to regulate. And also, but but oh, and I was thinking, you know, it's 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 basically benign. Of course, if you, people want to monetize their uh, beauty, their beauty um, or their bodies, then that's it's their beauty and it's their bodies. Mm. On the other hand, um, I wonder if I had a, a subscription. To I, an, I know what you're going to ask. Yeah, uh, to an OnlyFans. Uh, uh, if, if I'd signed up to look at somebody's boobs, yeah, would you feel comfortable with that? And again, I should mention I don't. I would not feel comfortable it's not a with confession that. On that air. I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I would feel. I don't know. It's funny, isn't it? Because I recognise that that, especially in a monogamous relationship, you know, you can't expect to be absolutely everything to to that person for the rest mm. of their life. That's unrealistic. And of course, you're going to see people in life that you think they're attractive. And we seem to think as a society that it's okay to say, "Oh gosh, Brad Pitt's very handsome," but it's mm. not okay to subscribe to a man taking his his Johnson out um, because that that is a bit sort of seedy. His Dwayne and the Rock bit, Johnson. His Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Out. I mean, I just subscribed to Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> I mean, highest paid actor. What you're going to pass? What a guy. Um, but 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 you, I think. I think it's a good point i really wouldn't feel comfortable you having a subscription i think maybe because it's a would be to a particular person that's the thing it make it a bit like more like cheating a, yeah then then looking at an actress or an actor and being like they're obviously incredibly beautiful mm. um but the one thing that, that i was going to say about about amaranth and, and this is why you shouldn't really ban things is i do think it's a really difficult problem for twitch um and one of the ways that you manage it is to regulate it so they have been updating their their sort of guidelines for what is appropriate content and what counts as actual kind of nudity and sex mm. content and what counts as just sort of titillating presentation and it's a really hard line to draw but bearing in mind that the reality is as it is and therefore there is going to be many more female streamers who are interested in presenting themselves in a slightly sexual way than male streamers mm. if twitch comes out and says um, female streamers have to wear necklines that are uh, no more than three inches below their clavicle and they have to wear long sleeves mm. and they have to do this and they have to do that. I will actually get quite uppity about that. I think it is deeply inappropriate to prescribe a particular gender, a particular dress code, if you're not going to do it in the same way to the other gender. And let's be honest, they could say the same 
clothing guidelines for, for men, but realistically, the ones they're impacting are the women. And I can't stand the idea of a corporation telling women how they should dress. I think that's a deep, that's a horrible step backwards. But but I can also see mm. from a kind of totally inhuman perspective, that would be a logical step, right? How do you breach the gulf between, but well, we want people to be on Twitch and stream games, and some of them are going to be very um, attractive, and some of them are going to want to, to wear revealing clothing to, to augment their brand, um, versus, you know, we don't want porn. And, and, and that gulf is difficult. Um, I mean, this is getting into kind of content moderation on social media. So the last, the last well, he, he, again, off topic, but uh, relevant. Uh, the last real job I had before I worked in games was with a software consultancy. And the first gig I had with a software consultancy was at Lloyd's of London. Not to be confused with Lloyd's Bank. Uh, Lloyd's of London is a, an insurance, I think it's technically a society rather than a business. Uh, it's a cult. Been around since... Uh, uh, 1600s, 1700s, um, and started out by insuring shipping, and is now the world's most famous insurance institution, and has an iconic building in the city of London um, with all the ventilation on the outside that I was very excited to get, get, get to work in. And it was interesting in lots of ways, and also soul-destroying and horrible, uh, as you might expect. And one of the things about Lloyd's, because it is so old, it is, or was, extremely traditional, and I had to wear a suit to work every day, mm. which isn't unusual, if you're working in the city of London, yeah, but it, but the, the the rule was specific. You know, they would not allow you in the building without a suit and tie. And I uh, was talking to to my uh, to, to, to the guy I worked with, uh, and he said that it was only a year or two before I started working there that um, they had nixed the rule where you needed to ask your manager for permission before you took your jacket off and put on the back of the chair. I mean, thought that was a good idea? Well, you know, in the 1850s, in the 1950s... It still wasn't a good idea. But... It just meant that people cared less about their workers. Women didn't wear suits. No, I mean, obviously didn't. women can wear suits, but it's... it's Could un- they, though? Could they wear trousers? They Well, that was the thing, is because it was such an insane traditional organisation, women weren't really subject to the same strict rules. Oh, because we were. weren't really meant to be there in the first place. Yeah, and that happened Oh, it's like Queen Victoria it. not, not uh, banning lesbianism because she didn't believe it existed. Which is sadly a myth, apparently. But... Oh, why would you ruin that fact? Sorry. I've been really happy with that fact. Anyway, oh. the, um, but, but the, the same guy who was telling me about the, um, uh, the, the relaxing the rules, one of the reasons they relaxed the rules is there'd been a really hot summer that had overcome the air conditioning. Oh, <laughs> you were going to say really hot intern. <laughs> Oh, well, that's not a good and, reason. <laughs> uh, and he said it was awful because as a man, you, you had to, to go around in uh, suit and tie. Yeah, Whereas awful. women, he said, were wearing was very nearly beachwear, so sun tops <laughs> and things. Because, you know, they just, they, 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 they weren't the rules. And, and especially in quite a traditional organisation, it's quite difficult to cut up to women and say, cover yourself. Yes, you're, so that's true. So it's the opposite of, 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 you know, what happens in, in some other context where women have to wear all the clothes covering themselves and men get to swan around in T-shirts. Yeah. So, but we need to bring this back to we do we do so um, uh, the segue into into 18th century French literature is I think some of the discourse about sexy games uh, divides in a slightly silly way and that is there's kind of the good sexy games the exploitative sexy games the good sexy games to your average middle of the road uh, multi progressive uh, games journalism outlet is uh, it's probably got some gay or queer romance uh, that is uh, foregrounded uh, it's not exclusively gay or queer um, it probably uses the word thirsty rather than the word horny because that's I a cultural hate signifier. The word thirsty. I find that it really means, gross. Means, I know what it yeah. means. I have a no, Generation but, Z sister. Figured, yeah, she but, explains but, this but, stuff. But you know, it's a cultural signifier. Um, and it, it probably doesn't involve oversized breasts because yes, those tend to it's be... it's very body yeah. positive and very kind of... Yeah. It, they try. I, th- I think a lot of those games, one of the key components is not just, you know, here's some, here's some sex. It's here's some sex across a wide spectrum of different people with different body types and different ethnicities and it's all very sort of let's all find the beauty yeah. in everyone and isn't sex great? Which is, and, you know, you great. Know, and that's the thing. It's nice to see that stuff happening. But there's this idea that if you get it off on uh, the one kind then you're basically doing something politically positive. And if you're getting mm. off on the other kind, mm. you're probably voted for Trump. 
Yeah, and that heter- heteronormativity is is sort of intrinsically bad, yeah. and I think I think that's a really interesting take because obviously the the games industry does want to be more progressive and does want mm. to change a lot of the ways. But I also think it's understandable, bearing in mind the reality as it is, that still our largest market is primarily young white males, mm. and most of them, statistically speaking, are probably going to lean more heterosexual and like looking at ladies than than you know other stuff. And even when it's it's not primarily young white males, the point is there's always going to be young males of, of whatever colour uh, yeah sorry the white doesn't really matter, does yeah. it but yes, it's, that's such a hollow phrase uh, the uh, like, I couldn't stop chunk. saying it I know uh, <laughs> the but I think I mean I'd, I'd rather live in a world where uh, gently progressive uh, publications get to enthuse about gay romance yeah. than one where gay romance is banned and the age of consent for uh, to be clear absolutely yes yeah. <laughs> but, it, but, but I also find it, it, it frustrating having to uh, see two different presentations of two ultimately similar games that haven't decayed to slightly different sort of taste but this is what brings me to the 18th century uh, traditional liberty novel so uh, this from a, a, an Anglo point of view this sounds endearingly and engagingly and stereotypically French. I don't know how much of the uh, stereotypical French reputation was forged in this particular crucible. Uh, There was a tradition of erotic literature which was both porny and philosophical. So So if you are are, um, a priest in the 1750s in France, there's lots of things you approve of and there's lots of things you don't approve of. And among the things you don't approve of are atheism and sex. <laughs> and so, you know, pretty soon some bright spark thinks, how about we put atheism and sex in a book? Yep. And I spent, uh, 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 you know, the sacrifices I make, I spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, 18th century engravings of people with their kit off. Yeah, turning it all round, getting the right... Well, specifically looking for an image that I can't find um, and, and, and maybe some help... What were you looking for? Know. What I was looking for is, is, is an image I remember seeing years and years ago in an article on exactly uh, this of two people um, in flagrante uh, with speech bubbles coming out of their mouths, quite lengthy speech bubbles, where it's sort of the, 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 the lady boffing the gent is, is saying something like, but in a, in a world without um, uh, uh, rules imposed by a uh, uh, supreme being, uh, how can we know what is appropriate morality? <laughs> and the gentleman would reply sort of similar length uh, while they're sort of grappling each other. And this, this, this was the thing, is that actually you can, you can debate the degree to which it played a part in uh, the awakening of political consciousness uh and i've no idea from this distance how much of it was like that how much it was just porn but certainly there was a tradition of philosophical porn that introduced radical or dangerous or innovative ideas in the context of people getting their kid off so therese philosophe which i'm not going to say with a french accent because I'll, I'll strangle myself on the r uh is i think the most famous of these and it's it's about this young woman who at the age of 11 is sexually precocious so her mother sends to her nunnery and then her libido starts kind of killing her but it's not being satisfied so her mother releases her and then she goes through this sort of series of weird uh misadventures uh like she ends up working with a famous prostitute who to the surprise and disappointment of many of her clients is actually still a virgin right she's just got a really sort of bulletproof hymen okay we've said that word so they keep style. they keep trying to deflower how it doesn't work and okay. this just makes it more popular okay i'm now uncomfortable with it um there's there's uh, a scene where where uh she meets a priest who is um introduced to somebody to sort of sacred ecstasy that is actually just actual sex but they think it's sacred ecstasy um and there's a uh, whole the climax is is a rich count wants her to become a mistress um, and she says, "No, I've, I've, um, I'm not doing anything with men anymore. I don't care. I find um, uh, creating my own orgasms much more satisfactory. Mm-hmm. So I'm done with, with with you lot." And he says, "Okay, well, here's a test. Um, if you can stay in a room full of erotic literature and pictures for two weeks without fudding yourself, uh, Alexis. Then, well, what phrase would you like me to use?" Uh, then um, I will take you as my mistress, but all I'll do is like read you poetry and ask you to take your clothes off. And otherwise, you know, we have to have sex. 
And she says yes, and she fails the test, and they live sort of possibly uh, happily ever after. But, you know, that's... Is that feminism? No. <laughs> but the point is that, that, that <laughs> at, the time, at the time it was a relatively frank discussion of uh, female desire yeah. and possible female independence from men. Yeah. And it's worth remembering these discussions occurred you know, before the 1970s. We didn't invent uh, either sex or, or sexual liberation. Mm-hmm. And that you see this theme, it's... it's, it's I mean, that sounds like is, it, is it feminism? The answer is no, uh, and you're right. But the question can be asked, and the question couldn't be asked about about a sort of centrefold in uh, penthouse. It's 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 nekomimi waifu Japanese yeah. sex scandal. And I think the thing is, people not everyone because you get people who are asexual or fed up with sex, or whatever. But people care about sex, and if you put something in a sexy wrapper, uh, it, it it allows you to ask more searching questions than you would otherwise. And this, this is always, always one of the things I thought about the Matrix. It's, it's, you know, it's more violence and martial arts and sex, mm. but it's sort of the success of liberty novels in that it gives you this uh, really sci-fi kung fu rapper, and it then asks a bunch of, of really uh, interesting questions. Yeah, I mean, sort of first-year philosophy questions, but first-year philosophy is interesting, and a lot of people wouldn't have come across those questions otherwise. So what we're saying to round up is: sex games are great, provided they're not horrible, hmm. and sex games of all types are great whether or not they're they're new and progressive and interesting or whether or not they're they're ladies with boobs out. Um, And if you want to teach people things or get them talking about things, um, sex is a great way to do that. Mm. I would love to know, I would love to know how much, what percentage of Valve's income comes from ridiculous sex games. I'm sure we'll never know. We know, they will never release those figures. Right, well, I hope you've enjoyed our slightly awkward discussion of sex. I hope you feel that it is something that you will talk about more. I'd like to credit um, (laughs) the uh, comic television show Extras, starring and created by Ricky Gervais, with my introduction to the word fudding. Oh, stop saying that word. I'm going to have to end the podcast so it doesn't say it again. Have a spooky day. (laughs) 